So tonight we'll be looking at the Holy Spirit and just what the Holy Spirit's operation and function is in our world today in the life of the believer. Um, important that if you're going to live the life here on earth, um, then the Holy Spirit operating in your life is essential. It is essential. It, there can be no, uh, no mixing, no you know, powdering up, if for want of a better expression, when it comes to the move of the Holy Spirit in our lives as Christians. It must be evident. It must be alive in us in order for us to really learn the things of God because the, the, the human mind cannot learn of its own accord. It's going to take the spirit and the spirit's teaching in order for us to learn the things of God. And in terms of that, the uniqueness of the spirit operating in us, and I use the word unique, because what it means is that for each individual, living an individual life with individual circumstances, with individual uh, things that are happening in your neck of the woods, the spirit has to speak to every individual situation. Because no two uh, you know, circumstances are exactly alike. And that's why as Christians, we need the spirit of God. So without further ado, we're going to go into the word. So if you have your Bibles, please go to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. And we'll be reading some scriptures. Of course, you know our questions um, that we always seek to have in mind as we deal with the master class subject uh, in its totality. And so we look at all of these and we know that as we discuss Bible and we discuss the word, these questions may just drop out as we go along and you'll get answers. Because that's how the spirit has to work with all of us. It, as, as you are taught, as you hear the word, there are going to be different things that the spirit will, will um, influence on you based on your circumstance. And so the questions become answered as the word is expounded. And sometimes as the word is expounded, it should actually also lead to questions that you want to search the scripture and search for more answers. So that in and of itself is also important. So Galatians chapter four, verse one, I trust you have uh, had it already. And we're just going to read some verses here as we establish the context of the Holy Spirit. So now I say that the here, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant. And before I go any further, this is Paul's uh, writing to the Galatian church. So these are the words of Paul to the church in Galatia. Though he be Lord of all, which is the here being a child differing not from a servant. Verse two, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, 
God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Verse 19. My little children, of whom I travail in birth again, until Christ be formed in you. And if you're going to take for the heading or the main verse, uh, if you're in Sunday school, they would talk about a main verse. And from my Sunday school days, you know, you have golden text. And then you would prepare and say, this is our golden text. Galatians chapter 4, verse 19. Uh, my children, my little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Now, if you're from my days, um, if you're from my days of uh, Sunday school and golden text, then you know golden text is something that you have to study to, to say it. Uh, um, by heart and uh, i used to remember some fun times because many times you had the book and your your golden text and you know you had the bible somewhere down there you're looking up at the, the teacher where you're looking down at the bible and if they're like you in my church like your church they give you points if everybody isn't reading <laughs> so uh, we remember many days when we would struggle to get points because uh, we, we weren't pre preparing. But be that as it may, the, the main subject line verse is verse 19. But in order for us to get to verse 19, it's important that we lay the context and the foundation by looking at the, those, uh, I think about five or six verses that I actually read before. And so in doing that, I'm going to do a little bit of a, a, a quick summary before we get to verse 19. And so I'm summarizing now in building the, the, the subject matter to where we want to go. So in verse one, it says, uh, here's Paul talking to the Galatian church. And you have to remember that when we speak to the Galatian church, um, one important aspect as you study scripture is it's always important to know when you're reading who is the audience that is being spoken of here. So it's not just the fact that Paul is talking, but it's important to know who he's talking to. If you can know at what point in history he's talking to them. And then you around that you you establish the context of why he's saying what he's saying. So Paul is talking to the Galatians, and in the time of the Galatian church, there is all there is every season of a church has different measures of oppositions, and the oppositions are both internal and external. By internal, I mean they are perhaps. Uh, of the same kindred as Jews. So the opposition then were um, the, what we would call them, the more uh, aristocratic uh, traditional Jews who for, what, for want of whatever reason wanted to maintain particular kinds of sacrifices or rituals uh, and then blend it into the the, the no christian born 
uh, developing church. So it became Judea Christian in nature, or for whatever reason, they, they, they wanted to, and especially as it relates to now the church being a blend of Jews and Gentiles, sometimes the external factors which were internal wanted to apply particular um, um, rights or customs to the Gentiles as against the Jews in the same Christian church. And so those are some of the things that Paul had to write to the various churches in contention with them in trying to build their faith and bring them to the proper light of the, the gospel of Christ. Because Paul preached nothing but the gospel of Christ. At one point he said, I want to know nothing else save Jesus Christ and him crucified. He was just a, 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 a walking, living preacher man and builder of churches, right? And so in verse one, he's talking to the church uh, and their opposition uh, is a group of people called the Judaizers. So he's saying to the church, that consider the fact now that uh, here, which is someone who has the rights to uh, his parents' property, um, he says to the church, if you consider it, I, 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 here, as long as he's a child, in essence, is no real different from the servant that's in the house. And why is that the case? Because he has no jurisdiction or no ability in order to orchestrate the affairs of what the, the, the property or the parents um, is, is, is uh, inheritance. He has no ability to really operate or orchestrate or to carry forth that inheritance once he's a child. So in essence, he is no greater than a servant in the house because he has to obey rules. He lines it out in verse two. He says, um, but he's under tutors and governors and until the appointed time of the father. Now we know that when Paul is saying anything, he isn't just saying it for saying its sake, right? Especially when you go into the epistles, there are many things that are said that are not just said simply for what they are. So, it, so really, he's trying to speak to the church because at this point, when he's speaking to the church, there are Christians which whom he would have spoken on a previous occasion which he would have taught them the gospel and he would have uh, entreated them and they were growing in a particular way and then came this opposition with some kind of uh, adulteration, addition, subtraction to the word that Paul would have brought to them. And now the same church is operating in, uh, uh, in principles that are not what Paul had taught them. If you actually read, and I'll give you that for your homework, to read verses, I went from verse one to seven, but it would be good for you to go from verses one to 19, where you will see from seven onwards, where he speaks to them um, about um, feast and new days and new moons, I think something like that. Um, if somebody, uh, goes just do a little bit of reading in. You can pop it in the chat um, to say what are some of the things he would have admonished them to say. Why are you going back to that, right? But he has to set the context, and he's setting it as we speak now from verse one. So he's saying what he's really saying to them is that as a child, you are no greater than a servant, and when you speak of servants. He's really speaking of the law. So he's saying to them, 
when you were under the regime of the Old Testament principles of the prophets and, and, when, and in the prophets' times of operating, that was when, as children uh, of Israel, Jews, Hebrews at the time, we were operating under the law. And so you are a servant to the law, and in that he 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 analyzes or he he gives, he symbolizes that as being a child. So you're under tutors and governors until the appointed time, and the tutors and governors, no doubt we know, are various sacrifices, the various um, sacrificial offerings, and the the tones, uh, uh, the tonal. Uh, um, sacrifices by the priests and so on and so forth. And so they were being guided in that manner in the Old Testament principle. So in verse 3 then says, even so we were children, uh, we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. Elements of the world there, as I said, is speaking to sacrificial rituals not elements as we probably would think of the cosmos or uh, elements as it relates to stars and moon no it's really the elements of the world which is speaking to uh, all these various sacrifices and um and he terms it as bondage notice bondage under the elements so so we were bond as 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 people trying to serve God, the Hebrews were under bondage. That is what he's really saying. Because in order for them to for God to accept them, they had to be giving thousands and thousands of 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 oxen and this offering and that offering. Um and they had to observe particular festivals and um you know the 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 whole role of the rotation of the seventh year and what happens at what they celebrate when and and the feast of weeks and uh, all of the shoe bread and all of that stuff and uh the priests had to go into the holies of holies and it was just a tremendous, he calls it bondage. If you think about it, in, you know, in reality, um, it must have been a, a, a hardious exercise. Um, and in Moses' time, it got so difficult for Moses that he had to, um, he had to, you know, to divest the responsibility of leadership. And so we, we saw all of that unfolding in the Old Testament. So the rituals are the elements of the world. So verse 4, he says, but in verse 4, he says now that but when the fullness of time, and note the word fullness of time, which deals with fullness there is dealing with the chronos, which means a particular point in time that God would have ordained, God would have pre-known that there was a particular point in time. It says God sent forth. Now I've got to go for my uh, share screen here, let me see. Because when we talk about sent forth, it's important that we understand what sent forth is talking about uh i kind i i have coined it um i've coined it the phrase the process of the sun and and so i don't want anybody to get confused this is just my um my phrase now this is not something that is coming from any um writing that is what would we say no it's it's any in any commentaries or any biblical principles uh, or something like that that's just simply my phrase the process of the sun 
and 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 I'll explain when I say process of the sun um, as I go along. So verse four says, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth, note, note the word God sent forth, his son made of a woman, made under the law. Now that seems pretty simple, pretty straightforward, right? But in truth and in fact, it's important that we visit and understand this process uh, um, you know acutely god sent forth now we know that god is invisible the bible says no man had seen god at any time and we know from that statement uh in terms of the woman at the well that she was told that God is a spirit. So they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God sent forth his son. So God that is invisible is going to send forth his son. Now we know from the earthly standpoint, when we refer to the son, we are talking about Jesus Christ that was born of the Virgin Mary. But if God is invisible and he sent forth his son, what, how does this take place? Uh, God sends forth his son. So is the son invisible? Is the son, uh, what, you know, what substance, what element is the son? If God is invisible and sending forth his son, then to some degree the son must have, if we, we are considering it well, some properties relating to, to the God, simply because we know that Mary was a virgin. Mary and Joseph didn't do anything to bring Jesus into the world. In fact, if, if it was left up to, to Joseph, he would have disowned Mary. Uh, it, it, it was the angel who had to go to Joseph and console the man and tell him and give him the scoop as to what was really happening that this is what is happening is of the holy spirit so right there and then we see the action of the holy spirit as in bringing about the son so god sent forth his son remember in john john 14 john 1 verse 14 it says that the word was made flesh which is why you see on my, uh, on my slide, beside his son, you have the Logos. So God invisible sends forth his son, the word, the Logos. So the word now becomes flesh, right? But this Logos, I want us to understand when we speak of Logos, Logos is not speaking definitively of what you see written or like what you have in your hand as your Bible. That is more known as rima, uh, a written word, scripture. Logos actually is speaking of God speaking. So it is God speaking and what is in God's mind is being sent forth verbally. So Logos then represents what God, what is in God, that he is sending forth verbally, God's word. So when God speaks and God's word, which is, it proceeds from God, God's word is God because it, it, it cannot be any different. Whatever he says, he means, right? And so therefore, this Logos is, is, is not representative. The Logos is the word, is his son in his pre-incarnate nature. Pre-incarnate nature. So God sends forth his son, made of a woman. So now that we have to do a little bit of uh, deduction, right? Because John 1 says, 14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. 
the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The only way we could appreciate God is Jesus being seen on the earth. Because God did has God has not been seen at any time by man. The word says it. No man had seen God at any time. So even when we see in scripture the word, the words professing and saying, God said, if you notice, if you track it, and I want you to track it for yourself, go throughout scripture and you will see whenever God shows up, he has to show up in through some medium where man can know that this is God with whom I'm talking to. And therefore, and more importantly, I'm trying to find it. I think I put it somewhere else. Because this is, this is very important to establish the context of where we're going. Come on now. John 1 verse 18. So make sure you have that. John 1 verse 18. No man had seen God at any time. So you can't say it's Mark says so. You can't say uh, uh, I'm making up any stories. The word says so. And if you're going to take the word for the word, then the word is true. Let the word be true, it says, and every man a liar. No man, no man. Adam never see God. Moses never saw God. Name all the men in the world, they never saw God. Why? Because God is invisible. What does 18 says? The rest of it, the only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father, he, he had declared him. So now, if we are to put the entire context together, Logos, which is the word of God, which was made flesh, and we beheld his glory, which is the incarnate Christ, word logos, now it becomes the pre-incarnate Christ. It means then that Jesus Christ, which is in God, his son, but in his in pre-incarnate nature, whenever God speaks, it is the Christ that speaks and reveals God to the world. So therefore, when we say, for example, uh, Jacob uh, wrestled, Jacob wrestled with a man. He didn't. What he wrestled with was the in the pre the the revelation of God in His Son. When uh, let me find another example. Let me find another example in creation. In creation, when the word says, and God said, word, let there be light, it is the son in the, in the triune God, the son now, that goes forth and does the creating. Why? If you want to, if you want, if you want, you, you want to, Back that up, I'll let you go to Colossians 1. Uh, let me see if I find it, and I'm, I'm, I'm running ahead now. Da, 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 da. Colossians 1, is it? Colossians 1. And I think it's verse somebody may find it before me, you can tell me.
All right, one second, let me just get my, oh no, you cannot zoom your recording. Fine. Sorry for the break in transmission. Uh, it, it's flowing as, as the different stuff is flowing. So I'm trying to find it so we can put context in the scripture. All right, so Colossians. Is it verse, is it verse nine? Uh, okay. Yes. No, 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 no. Colossians 1. Um, No, 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 not verse 9. Colossians 1, verse 15. But we can start from verse 14. So let me share that now. Sorry for the... Everybody seeing that? So for the break. So Colossians 1, 14. So, so here is Paul talking to the Colossian church. And he's saying to them that uh, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. So that, in, that is speaking of Jesus Christ who came to Calvary, died on the cross, uh, shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. And he goes further to say, what? Who is the in the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? So here we have Paul establishing the context. When he says image of the invisible God, he's, he's, he's literally saying this is the imprint. This is the very God himself. For by him, speaking of Jesus, were all things created that are in heaven, that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And note, I, I said how that, how that occurred, right? That occurred when he in his pre-incarnate nature i don't know if nature is the right word because i mean this is just all awesome but let's call it nature in his pre-incarnate nature right is logos the word so when god speaks and that word leaves the creative element of that word is the son and it is the son, S-O-N, that does the creating. God speaks, the son does the creating. So that's why Paul is here saying, for by him were all things created, because he is the word. When God said, let there be light, pump, pop, Jesus creates light, right? In him were all things made that were in heaven and in the earth and visible and invisible, whether there be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. He goes on to say that, and he is above all things and by him all things consist. Uh, we're kind of straying into a different di dimension here, but let me just finish it. And it says, and he is the head of the body, which is the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things, note the word, all things, he might have the preeminence. So here we have the establishment of the pre-incarnate Christ, the Logos, the word that is in God, who does all the activities as it relates to creative power. Man, breathing into man is the pre-incarnate Christ. So let's get back to 
what I was trying to establish. I hope I didn't uh, pull you up too much with that, um, but it's important. So we're at the point where we're talking about he was made flesh, which is verse four. So he was made flesh, made of a uh, made of a woman, which means he was made flesh. So pre-incarnate now becomes incarnated, right? We are now seeing God, and here again, it's very important for us to to understand what this process is all about as it relates to God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. Is it that? Is it too? Um, you know, is a transformation. Is he transforming from invisible to visible, or or is he is he some sort of mixing going on between uh, some um, medium, some element of an invisible medium and an element of uh, a physical medium? That's also important. Let me see if I have that in my slide because I want you to to actually read as I read. Um, made flesh yes so made flesh or made of a woman so if you take note this was not done by the change of one nature into another meaning the divine into the human or the word into man meaning the word logos was changed into a man that's not what happened what happened was by the assumption, meaning the taking on of human nature, the word taking on human nature into personal union with itself. This is what we call deity, the divine. Uh, Christ being all man, all God. So he does not move from um, one property, or one um, nature to another, he is still Christ. Note it says, whereby the natures were not altered. So the human nature, uh, when, when, when the, for, for want of a better word, if you call it a, a, is a, a, a reaction, and, and, and I'm very careful, brethren, you no, know, even in explaining these things, I'm very careful even the analogies that I use, because I believe for, for God's word to remain uh, authentic to his name and to his people, that even the very examples that I use uh, need to be tried and tested. So right now it's like, um, I feel like even when I'm talking to you, I have to be treading on some serious waters because I'm, I'm really, as a human being trying to express God in the flesh. Um, the word just says, great is the mystery of godliness, which means up to this date, we still have not fully conclusively uh, and fully in our human thoughts and expressively gotten all of the divine understanding as it relates to God in the flesh. Nonetheless, the natures were not altered. So therefore, Christ remained what he was and became what he was not, which means Christ remained in his state as God and he took on flesh. So the flesh was in union with himself. So, so, he, so in becoming man, he did not change who he was. He did not become any less he did not become any different he did not diminish anything about his uh his character so to speak he he, he his divineness did not change he was still the creator he was still god he just took on flesh and in taking on flesh the word says he became a servant. So verse, uh, let me establish that. We're back at verse. Uh, he be made under the law to redeem, to redeem them that were under the law that we 
might receive the adoption of sons. Now, again, I have to look even further at this verse, because remember now we said it, it, it's important that we establish who uh, Paul is talking to, and he's talking to the Galatian church, and he's referring to them talking. If you notice, he, we, we established that he was talking about their history and what they were doing in terms of um, the rituals and the elements of the world, and they were under the law. Which means then that in truth and in fact, when God in the form of his son came to the world, and he says made under the law to redeem them, them who? That's the next question. Them who? That were under the law. Because in truth and in fact, uh, when we look at Old Testament, the only people or set of people that were under any kind of law as it pertains to God were the children of Israel. And he's talking, here is Paul talking to the church in Galatia, which are Jews, which are descendants of Israel. No, no, the church, no, at this point is a mixture of Jews and Gentiles. So where does the Gentile man fit into this kind of redemption? Uh, let me see if I have it in my screen. And this is where I subscribe, I subscribe, note the word, to the Gill commentary um, to give us a better appreciation and a better understanding of what it means when we talk about the them that were under the law and then the rest of us. Because if Jesus only redeemed, um, we know that when he came to the world, he died for all sinners. But here is Paul talking about them that were under the law. So by whom are meant chiefly the Jews who are elsewhere represented as in and under the law? in distinction from Gentiles who were without it. And the reference there is Romans 2 verse 12. The Gentiles indeed, though they were not under the law of Moses, yet were not without law to God. They were under the law of nature. This is why we see Christ taking on human nature. And by taking on human nature, he is covering for all man. Because, note again, Paul, when he started out, told them that the son, as long as he's a child, the here, as long as he's a child, is no different from a servant. Born servant. In those days, servants were considered uh, not necessarily a part of the the nation but they were they were they were for want of a better word um not necessarily um hebrew by birth but servants because the hebrews would take servants from various nations because even at that time hebrews were intermixing and uh, they were, they were having other nations as a part of their, 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 their society, if for want of a better word. And so in terms of the law and God, human nature is what Christ came to defeat. And so in saying that they were under the law, both the law of uh, the sacrificial offerings and the law of nature. So therefore, what we have is Jesus coming in the form of uh, in, in flesh to redeem them that were under the law, the word redemption. If you remember from, if you remember from uh, when we looked at, uh, what was it? That was, we looked at Ruth and Naomi and 
Boaz, Boaz is a type of Christ because Boaz was um, Boaz was the Kingsman redeemer that bought back Naomi's property. And so in the in the in the type in the typology, uh, Boaz becomes a type of Christ. In fact, if you look at again, remember we studied it, the lineage of Boaz, where uh, he begot Obed, Obed begot Jesse, and you know, Jesse begot David, and who is of the lineage of David? None other than Jesus Christ from his earthly parentage. Jesus is of the lineage of David. So here it is. It says he's here to redeem them that were under the law. So he's talking about redemption. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth, verse 6. So, oh, sorry, let me just say, so that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now, I found this pre pretty interesting because first he called them a here as a child, and then he classified them as no, no different than a servant. And so, essentially, really what he's saying was that Israel, because of sin and the law, not because God chose you or selected you, it doesn't really mean that you are any better off than those who were not selected. So in truth and in fact, he's saying to Israel, you're just as human, just as faulty, just as frailty. I only selected you as the prime example of what I wanted people to understand what salvation is going to do for man. So I had to select a group of people, and through that group of people, I had to reveal myself and show my kindness and show my redemptive power and show what it means for man to have a relationship with God because Adam had destroyed our relationship. And in trying to reestablish that relationship, I had to take a set of people. But in truth and in fact, Israel, you're no different than the servant. You're no different than the bond slave. You're no different than um, the, 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 the Hittites and the Jebusites. Um, they didn't have any law, and so they operated according to their own free will. You had the law, but the law was not perfect, and the law could not make you perfect. So here again, Paul is saying that the only thing that really has made us perfect is God in the flesh coming, dying for our sins to redeem mankind back to himself and made us uh, in the stead of now being adopted as sons. And so here it is, I'm going to go back to another uh, established principle. Note I said that this is something, uh, the process of the sun, the process of the sun is a phrase I coined, right? So it's not found anywhere. Don't go searching for it. Uh, you'll only see it on these PowerPoint slides, right? But there's a reason why I, um, I use this phrase because if you remember the first process of, of the sun, and I'll take you back. The first process of, of the sun was God, the invisible God, sent forth his son, Logos. That son became flesh, made of a woman, birth. and made under the law. Notice the process. God to the Son manifests the Son in flesh, right? Made under the law. The next process of the Son, which is in verse 6, now it says, and because ye are sons, now speaking to the, today's church, 
he's now speaking of today's church, the Galatian church. You are no sons. You are not servants anymore. Worse, you're not children. You, well, in the sense of under the law, you are no sons. And he says, because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So verse 6 takes a similar position, actually. Uh, it's very similar if you look at verse 4. Because God sent forth his son. Now he's sending forth the spirit of his son into your hearts. Crying, Abba, Father. So here it is, in other words, God is sending the spirit of his son. The spirit of his son is the spirit of Jesus Christ. The spirit of his son is the nature of Christ. Because what is in you, if we take it from a, hum a human context, I can't see your human, uh, I can't see your spirit. I can't see your nature, right? I can only see the visible you, the visible you as a particular shape, the visible you have particular uh, features, but the spirit you, human spirit you, resides in you. That is why God says he made him uh, us in his image. There is a visible you, there is a, a spirit you, and there is a soul you, okay? So God sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now, therefore, I have here the nature of Christ birthing in us or on our human nature. So if you notice, it's almost very similar, very similar to the process of God sending forth his son, born of a woman, which is born through Mary. The same process is being repeated where the spirit Spirit of the Son on us now as his children are related. God sends forth that, that spirit, spirit invisible of his Son, right, Christ, into our hearts. And when it speaks of heart, there it's really speaking about uh, your desires into, into the, the inner recesses of what controls how you operate internally. It controls how you think in, in your heart. Heart and mind are generally uh, uh, added some together in the same context, whereby crying, Abba, Father. So it is the spirit of Christ, the nature of Christ, being birthed in our nature. Same sort of principle. So here we are now at verse 19. And before we get to verse 19, I did verse 6 just now. And it says, Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then and hear of God through Christ. He started out with the word here and showed them that they were children being no different from a servant. And he ends up at verse seven with them now being rightful ears, but through Christ, they are hearers of God. And a hear of God then is, um, if, if, there are, if, there, if you're a hear of God, in the same sort of uh, the same sort of principle of being a heir to an inheritance, it means that your father um, controls the, the 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 wealth. So here it is: you're a heir of God. God is the father. You are son. Son in the you remember this word similitude that we spoke about the last time in this likeness of. Christ, which is why the Bible says, 
Now are we the sons of God. Christ, the son of God, but we are also now sons of God. Why? Because through the spirit of adoption, which God, Christ in God, purchased for us on Calvary, we are now adopted into the spirit, into, into Christ. And it's significant for us to understand being in Christ. That's why uh, it says, Behold, if you're in Christ, you're a new creature. All old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And so we end up now with verse 19, where he goes back. He goes back to talking about little children. Because remember, the gap between verse 7 and verse 19 is, is literally scolding them for going back to the customs and the rituals and the the new moons and uh, serving days and so on and so forth. And so we know that uh, in Christ, there is, um, there is no set aside day, so to speak, where we have to do things customary. Every day is a church day. Every day is a worship day. Every day is a day to give praise. Every day is a day to give thanks. There is no necessarily set aside day, for example, um, and I, I soon get back to my screen. Um, there, is no, there is no set aside day where you keep a day holy. You can't keep a day holy because you in and of itself can't even keep yourself holy unless God helps you to be holy. There, there is no way to keep, uh, um, there's, no, there's no, if you really think about it, and sometimes I think as, you know, as Bible believers, you know, we need to think, uh, as an engineer, I think there's a lot of logical thinking that goes on in my head, right? And uh, Sansei will tell you that, uh, between herself and, and I, uh, I, I may be logical thinking, step one, step two, step three, step four. Before I go to step four, I complete step three. Uh, then step five comes after six. Naturally, after six comes seven. So, 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 so there are a lot of logical principles because that's how my brain functions in a sense. I know the female brain um, and, you know, it's very different, very unique, very wonderful. Uh, and, you know, it, it, it's like, I remember they saying that the, the, the female mind is like spaghetti. If you put everything down on the spaghetti dish uh, and you take up everything, um, you, you, can't, you can't deduce the end from the beginning. That's just how unique the female mind is. Uh, the male brain is more like uh, waffles, <laughs> where, where you see, the, the individual squares of the waffles. So you can put little, little, little stuff in the, in the square. So I got waffle brain, all right? So, but that being said, that being said, if you look at the logics of some things that are ascribed to, you, we realize that in truth and in fact, it could not save you. It could not save you to say you don't eat particular things. It cannot save you to say if, if I, for example, uh, and I hope there are no, uh, you know, people who don't like certain meats here. Or, or so let me, let me stick with, uh, I like pork. Let me go there. I like pork, right? So let's say it, abstaining, if, if, if I eat pork, then I can't go to heaven. No, of all the other things that I may do that may be killing me, um, if we think about it logically, that could not prevent you from having a relationship with God. Because if we read further along in our, in our Bibles, you understand where it says, um, uh, and, 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 and I'll find it and I'll send it to you, where Paul speaks to uh, the Corinthians and he was telling them about meats. And the important thing important thing when it relates to 
those subject matters is a matter of offense. So if I know you have an issue with particular things, then I won't do it in your presence, right? So he says, so he says the same meat that is offered to, uh, uh, as a sacrifice is sold in the market. And if I go and buy it in the market, and if I bless it and I give God thanks for it and I eat it, I have not committed a sin. So, so that in and of itself uh, cannot prevent me from, from not going into the kingdom or being seen as not being in the will of God. Nonetheless, that's not what we are talking about. Where did we get? How did we get here? My little children. Let's get back on course. My little children. So he's at verse 19. And here you now we're going to establish, um, we're going to establish the aspect of the work of the Holy Spirit. My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. So Paul is saying, Paul is saying to the, the Galatian church that because you're going back to these elements, because you're going back to these rituals, uh, I have to come and refresh your mind again and tell you just how dear you are to me and how much I have travailed in, in birth. And this is figuratively now. I'm travailing in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Christ being formed in us is a work of the Holy Spirit. Christ being formed in us is a work of the Holy Spirit because it gives outward expression to one's inward character the holy spirit has to work on my inside until christ is expressed on my outside because the fact that i'm born again the fact that i'm birthed into the kingdom is not the end all of my salvation because salvation has three aspects to it three components there is the, the justification, there is sanctification, and sanctification has two components, both of which, both of which are governed by the Holy Spirit and glorification. So, so your, your entire salvation package is done in three elements justification which is where you are brought into the righteousness of christ and that righteousness is what is termed a positional righteousness it it is it is denoted it is as of you uh, it is as if you would have never sinned so when you are washed in the blood when you are baptized into christ that baptism represents a positional righteousness. So, because no, 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 no. There is nobody that went in the pool and got wet and came out a saint. At least show me. I don't know. Maybe there's someone here. Maybe, maybe one of you know. Maybe somebody in the in the group here. You know, you went into the pool. Oh, I see one hand up. So, uh, I'm I'm happy for you. You went into the pool. And when you came out of that water, you came up totally sanctified, holy, and ready to be ushered out like Enoch. I don't think so. Uh, when you came out, that was your positional justification. It, was as, it is as if you have never sinned. And that is why it's important that when we speak about being born again, 
When we speak about being born again, the Bible says you're born of the water and you're born of the spirit. When you're born of the water, that is your positional, your justification, righteousness. You're, you're, you, you have the righteousness of Christ. That's why we are baptized into Christ, into Christ's righteousness. Why? Because when Christ, who did not change his nature, put on human nature, he never sinned. He took on the form of man and he never sinned, but he became sin. In one, in one way, the writer puts it like this. It's like um, he, he was not an adulterer, but he became adultery. He was not a fornicator, but he became fornication. So he became the known and not the verb, right? He became the, the, not the act, but the nature of it. And he crucified that nature on Calvary and redeemed mankind to himself. That is why Paul spoke about being redeemed, uh, brought back to God through Christ. And so this is why we are baptized into Christ, because Christ is the only begotten, the only God-man who walked this earth and paid the perfect price. Perfect price. It was the perfect price. So when you're baptized into Christ, positionally, you are baptized into his righteousness. But your salvation has two other phases. It has sanctification, which is both positional also and progressive. Positional in the sense where the Holy Spirit comes upon you, comes in your life, but then the work of the Holy Spirit is what helps you in progressive sanctification, which is throughout the life of the Christian. Because you are progressively being sanctified until you die. You are progressively, you are progressively getting holy. You are progressively getting um, more, more perfect. You are progressively becoming more and more like Christ. This is why Paul is again saying, I am travailing. I am travailing in birth pains. Like, like, like I am giving birth. Again, notice the process of the sun. The process of the sun is a process of being born, and it always seems to come back to this birthing, this birthing. So even Paul, as a man, is talking about the, the process of bringing forth a child. So he's talking from the context of a woman who is in great pain and in great anguish. He is travailing in birth again, until Christ be formed, formed, which is to be expressed, that outward, uh, the inner nature, that inward character that he placed in you becomes the outward expression. Because right now, Galatia, your outward expression is you're going back to rituals, you're going back to the beggarly elements, you're going back to the elements of the world. And so the whole work of the Holy Spirit is being hindered because you're going back to your old nature. This is something you have to understand. The Holy Spirit will be dormant in us whenever we can't move in the, the, the things and progressively in the things of God. You can have the Spirit in you, sitting down like a volcano for decades. And nothing not erupting because you're going back to the old nature. The old nature. So, so, so the working of the Spirit can't get to express Christ in his true character in your life outwardly. Because that is one of the, 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 the works or the functions of the Holy Spirit. Let me see if I can find. No, 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 that's not it. 
go to John, go to John chapter 16, verse 12. And in John chapter 16, verse 12, the Holy Spirit will reflect Christ himself. That's what we're talking about, the Holy Spirit reflecting Christ. There we are. I have yet many things to say to you. This is Jesus speaking, but he cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, and when he says he here, he's talking of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. When he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you in to all truth for he holy spirit again note is he calls he's given the holy spirit the, the 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 pronoun he he shall not speak of himself this now i pause right here to to let us understand again the similarities of the process when christ was on earth manifested the pre-incarnate manifested in the flesh when he was on earth notice how jesus operated when he was on earth he said there's nothing that i do that i do of myself it is it is the father that doeth it through me and the same the same process now is now being transferred to the holy spirit because the only only force the only spiritual force that is operating in our world today the only spiritual force that is operating in our world today i'm saying that distinctly is the holy spirit you had god the father operating in the old testament during the dispensation of the law when Christ came on earth, it was God the Son operating in the earth, in flesh, the word becoming flesh. And now, at this point, he's beginning now to transfer the ministry, the ministry of reconciliation between God and man to the Holy Spirit. So here it is. He says in 13, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he shall show you things to come. He, and I've put in bracket the Holy Spirit, that's not in your Bible, but I'm just letting you know that it's the Holy Spirit. Every time you see he is the Holy Spirit, shall glorify me christ for he shall receive of mine and show it to you it's the same way in which christ operated when he was on earth you remember when he was at the tomb of lazarus and he said to lazarus he said that father i i i i cried unto thee and not that you don't always hear me because i know you hear me always but for the people so whatever christ is doing he does it through the will of the father whilst he was on earth and it's the same thing for the holy spirit the holy spirit operates in the world christ the holy spirit operates in the world because that that spirit is hearing from christ and revealing christ in us by showing us truth and so it is that holy spirit that reflects christ on the inside we spoke about sanctification and this is where we are going to um do the part one of our two-part series this is a two-part series you can we can't take all of this in one bite believe that you'll get I will get indigestion if we do if we do all of this in one bite, right? Right. So the work of the Holy Spirit, as I as I said earlier, is in the process of our sanctification, and the sanctification is also 
positional and progressive. Galatians 5 verse 5, for we through the spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Waiting there does not denote standing still. It does not denote being in one place and looking for something to happen. Waiting is really a period. It's like you have a waiting period. So you have a period where you have to wait until something happens at the end of that period. And the waiting period is your sanctification, which is your lifetime when you're, when you're born again, living in Christ, living the Christian life. For we through the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, wait, we, are, we, we wait via the Spirit's process in sanctification for the hope at the what? Of righteousness, which is by faith. Righteousness by faith is the first aspect, as I said before, of your salvation. You have, you have been given a righteousness, which is by faith, because our righteousness, as the Bible says, filthy rags, filthy rags, could not, could not match up to anything. Not worth, not, not, not worth, not worth anything. There's nothing that we can ever put before God to say um, that it would make us qualify um, to enter heaven or to be in his relationship. So it is by sanctification, which is a work of the Holy Spirit. The next, the next function of the Holy Spirit, which is one where we have to work on and I coin it this way, my only defense against the fruits of the flesh. Oh, Jesus, we talk about flesh, fruits of the flesh. And I bet when you see flesh, everybody start to think, well, oh, Brother Mark talking about flesh. Uh, is he talking about uh, all of those proclivities? You know, we call them proclivities or tendencies or um uh you know well fruits of the flesh is is anything unrighteous so don't get it twisted though. anything unrighteous the holy spirit is my defense is like your defense against cavities is colgate the holy spirit is your defense against the fruits of the flesh so like how you have fruits of the spirit you have fruits of the flesh Fruits of the flesh, here, fruits of the flesh, Paul is also telling them one of the, the things you were birthing, why I have to go back in, in travail for you, was because you're going back to producing uh, rituals. Those are fruits of the flesh. You're going back to uh, worshiping days and new moons. Those are fruits of the flesh. You're going back to um, different customs that have nothing to do with the the efficacious blood of Jesus Christ. God, God in Christ mashed that down a long time. Why are you going back to manifest those fruits? Those are fruits of the flesh. So we're not talking just about sin and adultery and fornication and stealing and lying and bad mouth and, and, and backbiting and envy and lasciviousness and jealousy and, uh, and robbing and stealing and um, um, not giving your fair share on the job. That, that is fruit of the flesh thing. Jesus of mercy. When you rob the boss time, fruit of the flesh. You know, let us think about it. So, so, so Galatians 5.16. This I say then, walk in the spirit. Walk in the spirit. And ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Ye shall not make, ye, when, when it speaks of fulfilling the lust, you won't produce these bad fruits. You won't produce, your works will not produce these bad fruits. It will not fulfill in the negative. And walking, it's important for us to understand, do I, have, do I have walk 
I'm not even sure if I have walk. No, I don't have walk. But the 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 Greek terminology for walk is be constantly under the influence. So we're not just talking about walking as in walking, you know, your foot walking. It's really being occupied with. Be constantly under the influence. If you want to refer it another way or say it another way, we could say be constantly under the influence of the spirit. It's like, be, it's like you're saying be constantly drunk. If so be the case, be constantly under the spirit. Be constantly under the influence of the Holy Spirit. It is a constancy. It is a constancy. And next week, we're going to talk about the spirit uh, lending uh, uh, to, to envy. I think that's the terminology. I'm not quite sure. The spirit yearned to envy. Uh, and that's another context that we, we, we will see just how much the, the spirit wants to work in our lives. So, so be constantly under the influence. It is important. Why? Because Christ being righteous in the in positionally does not mean the spirit is working in you operationally. You're in Christ, a new creature, but unless the spirit begins to operate and have influence in your life, then the human nature cannot acquiesce to the Christ nature. Remember when we went to that second spirit of this. Uh, process of the sun, it was the Christ nature that was now being put on my human nature, which which became God sending forth the spirit of his son. But if that spirit is not influencing my life, if I'm not walking in that spirit, if I'm not under the influence of that spirit, then I won't bear the fruits of Christ. And this is why sometimes we can look at some people or people uh, and say, boy, them now live no life. Based on our interpretation of what life is, because there is some evidence based on what we see that they are still doing particular things, even though they call themselves Christians. The final thing I will note with you is the work of the Holy Spirit to entrust one's spiritual well-being to Christ leads to the receiving of the gifts, the gift of the Spirit. And I want you to look at, I'm going to leave this for your homework, uh, for you to look at Acts 19, Acts chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. Acts chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. And you can read all the way down to verse 6, where Paul was passing through the upper course. Uh, and while Apollos, it says, was at current, Paul, having passed through the upper course, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. Note the word disciples. He said unto them, have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believe? And they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any holy ghost. Now this is after Christ was ascended. And the, and the Christian church after the day of Pentecost was established. And so the Christian church was being uh, um, propagated by the apostles and Paul. And here he talks of Apollos, And my note here is to entrust one's spiritual well-being to Christ leads to the receiving of the gift of the Spirit. That's what it means to believe, to entrust your spiritual well-being to Christ, to let Christ have total control, to let Christ have total influence, to let Christ uh, be, be, be the, the, the dominant force of operating in your life. Have you received the Holy Ghost since he believed? Which means then that there needs to be some level of, uh, there. if you are looking contextually at scripture, 
there is some level of belief system that accompanies the Holy Spirit. And we'll go into that next week. Any questions? Any comments? I have a comment. And it's as it relates to Galatians 5, verse, verse 5. And you spoke about the waiting period or the processing period. Um, and you mentioned that. I'm trying to find the verse. I think it's 19. Let me just sign it up. Or you would you would have it up. Um Galatians 4 verse the 19, verse 19. Uh-huh. I'm just trying to come back in Acts. Okay, right. Um, as 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 it relates to to chapter to verse six, and he says that um, God had sent forth the Spirit of His Son unto your hearts, crying, "Abba, Father." Just the first part of it, saying that once you have um. Once you have accepted Christ as your personal savior, then your then his Holy Spirit is deposited in you. And the waiting period will be maybe the period in which you said you're being sanctified. Yes. So it's 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 the period where it's a, the processing period or the transformation, transformational period of the Holy Spirit working through you and having a outward transformation like i mean people can see your life and see that your life is aligned to christ or christ teaching or yes. the characteristics of christ yes okay i just want to say it out loud so i under, understood what you're saying what are you saying out loud what i just said <laughs> Are you, are, so what is it, where is it that you, because you mentioned the word waiting. No, because you had mentioned the waiting, the waiting period. Uh -huh. And it's not a standstill period. Yes, I'm, so right. How, right, so how I see it is, yes, when you say waiting period, it's, you, you, it's you, your it might, it, wait, wait, it might, right, and it might take on yeah. a negative connotation to say, fine, you're just, waiting to see what happens but no. it's, how i see it is that it's a, it's a transformational period where the holy spirit is working in you once you once you allow him to yes. work mm -hmm. yes yes yeah. that waiting is 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 not a a standstill wait like you're in a line waiting is really like a looking forward to because the word hope so so the gift through the spirit you wait so through through the the working of the spirit in your life through the course of your life you await your the hope and the hope really is the glorification the glorification where you are now transformed and you are like christ but that is all predicated on your righteousness, which is by faith. Because you came into a righteousness, a righteousness which is first by faith, which is where this is where I talked about it being positional, just as if which is the same thing as justification, just as if you have never seen you are justified by his righteousness, right? You wait 
through sanctification, which is progressive, which is a work of the Holy Spirit, making you more and more like Christ, to the hope of your, it is like the hope of what you started out for. It's like, that's what it's really saying. You're, you're going through this period in, in, in hope, with the hope of what you started out expecting. Okay. Um, you mentioned, I think you said there were three stages, justification, sanctification, and I think I missed the first one. Glorification. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, I liked the, 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 well, it's a good reminder of um, when you stated that the Holy Spirit is working in us so that we can express Christ's character outwardly. Because sometimes as Christians, we tend to profess that we have the Holy Spirit and we don't love, we don't care for each other, we don't demonstrate then the, the fruits of the, of the Spirit. Sometimes we are more concerned about the, the gifts rather than the fruit. Yes. So it is important that um, if we're professing to have the Holy Spirit, it's not saying that yes, I have the Holy Spirit, but showing then or your by your the fruits then that your actions, what you do should show people then that you have the Holy Spirit. It's not to um, say yes, you have the Holy Spirit, but let your your actions then show people that the Holy Spirit is living in you. Yes, and I, 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 I will say that it's, it's, it's important that all of us know that the Spirit is within us and we see that truth that the Spirit is leading us into because one of the, one of the, the most important things about, about Christian belief in the dispensation of grace is that the spirit has to teach. The spirit has to teach from the, from the inner man. There's a part in the word where it says that you, 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 you need no man to teach you because the spirit teaches you. And, and I'll find, I'm going, what I'm gonna try and do is to compile a list of of scriptures dealing with the spirit and just send it out via email. So. If you want to, uh, if you have not yet given your email, uh, you can send it in, send it in the chat or send it to um, one of the ladies here. Because I think it's, it's so important that we understand and, and really have a, a firm biblical understanding of the Holy Spirit. Uh, there are several other aspects of which that aspects of which uh, maybe we will touch some next week. We have when you talk about the anointing of the spirit. When we talk about being filled with the spirit. Uh, when it, it, when when we talk about the gifts and especially the aspect that we talk about speaking in tongues. Um, you know, you come from the from the if you're from my apostolic background and from my apostolic church church lineage and history um you know i i find that you know you i i i really want to diligently search the word even as it relates to the gift of the spirit because even in in that last chapter that that last chapter that i gave you of acts you realize just how important it is that in order in order for 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 you to really come to a great understanding of belief you have you have to understand the gospel it's important to understand the gospel of grace because even when paul had asked uh these disciples note the word now disciples he said the first thing he said because there must have been a reason why they are classified as disciples 
And then he says to them, well, if you are disciples, have you received the Holy Ghost? And then he says, since he believed. He, he's predicating the fact that they are disciples, that they have a particular belief. And if they have a particular belief, then he's saying, you should, receive, you should have then received the Holy Ghost. And then, he's, and then they in turn say to him, we have not so much as even heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And then the question he asked them is, then unto what were you baptized? So, 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 so here it is again, if we're talking about the spirit working in today's Christian church, what is he talking about, about belief? What is he talking about then as it relates to receiving the Holy Ghost since he believe and since and then if he have not received the Holy Ghost, then he asked the question, then what were you, to what were you then baptized? And their answer was unto John's baptism. And so that in and of itself needs a whole leap of dissecting because obviously understanding the gospel is also important to understanding the spirit. If we have no more comments, uh, I want to let you go. A lot for you to chew on tonight. A uh, lot for uh, Miss B is going to go to bed dreaming about the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit because she's going straight to bed after this. So I want to send her off with a Holy Ghost prayer uh, so that, I mean, you see, you wake up with a. And here's another word I was about to say, it, uh, and we'll go into it. Um, when we talk about fresh anointing, would you believe that we have to even understand the context of what we talk about fresh anointing? Because one anointing is enough. When, when the Holy Spirit came on Jesus, when he went in the water and John saw the sign of the Holy Spirit descending on a dove and he was anointed, the Holy Spirit, and he spoke about the Spirit of the Lord was upon me because he had anointed me to do X, Y, Z, A, B, C. It was one anointing for ministry. He needed no other fresh anointing. We, we have to be careful. When you say, Lord, give me a fresh anointing. What are you talking about? You have anointing already? You have what you need is to be filled with the Spirit. What you need is that anointing to boil up, fill. So, so when you're operating, you're operating in what is called the fullness of the Spirit. So sometimes, you know, we coin these phrases, Lord, give me a fresh anointing. Uh, you know, like, you know, if you, if you get something fresh, if you get something different, you can do something different. I'll, I'll, I'll go through the context. Yeah, I've been reading in you know, a version. I've been reading. Uh, it has me up at nights, and I tell you, it's like, oh, my God, I got to say, Lord, help me. Help me to, this, to, to deliver this word because I, I know there are some people who need this word. You can't have me up at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning just going through and can't sleep. And, uh, I tell you, it's like you sleep, I, something I nudge you to get up to read again because somebody needs to get a full appreciation, including myself, of the work and the function of the Holy Spirit. Because I want to be able, uh, I confess, I want to be able to even move away from whatever bias I may have had coming out of my church norms. I, don't, I want to operate in the word, the word, the unadulterated, the straight talk, spiritual nature of Christ. I don't want to even operate from the fact that they call you apostolic or they call you church of God or they call you whatever, what are they, new day or they call you whatever. I want to operate from the word. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your goodness and for your grace and your mercy. 
Lord God, we just want to give you thanks, Lord God, for what you have uh, uh, you have spoken to us, your Rima word tonight. We bless you, Lord. We pray for the your, your outpouring of yourself, your Holy Spirit that is now operating in this world. We pray that it will illuminate our minds, illuminate our, 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 our intellect, Lord, illuminate our faculties. Lord God, help us to see you, the only God, the image of him, the created one, Jesus Christ, Lord. Help us, Father, as we, we dissect your word, oh, Father, just to be filled with your Holy Spirit. Filled, 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 filled with your spirit, filled to run through, filled with your knowledge, knowing that you are the righteous one. We bless you, Lord. Remove the scales from our eyes, Lord, and help us to live in the freedom of the spirit. Lord God, help us, Lord God, not to be, ex to be afraid to express you, the Christ who is on the inside as a measure of the outward character. And we pray that the Spirit of God will have free flow in our lives, God. So you will speak when you want to speak. You, Lord God, will, will elevate and you will, oh God, just reflect how you want to reflect and make us power Christians, Father, in the name of Jesus. We bless you. We give you thanks. We worship at your feet. And we await, Lord God, another move of your spirit. Bring us back, Lord God, if you, you choose next week so that we can conclude, Lord God, this, this, this dynamic, Lord God, wonderful experience of the Holy Spirit. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.